Larry Rogstad. Shifting gears for a little bit. Um, Mr. Rogstad is a representative from Colorado Parks and Wildlife, and we had anticipated some public comment on the draining of Wanaka Lake, but we heard about other wildlife issues here today. But we thought we'd have given opportunity if council has questions about, um, certainly the communities had some questions about the wildlife and the impact that draining the lake will have on the turtles and other bird species. So we'll let you have the floor and <coughs> ask your questions after. Okay, thank you. I'm Larry Rockstead. I'm an area wildlife manager with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. I oversee operations in area two, which includes uh, a town of Lafayette is uh, smack dab in the middle of it. Um, if you, I'm a southerner, and if you give a southerner a pulpit, he's liable to preach a little bit. And uh, the earlier topic that you alluded to on, uh, in terms of wildlife, um, I'm going to just do a, a very brief comment. Um, feral cats are problems throughout many, many, many communities. One aspect that is uh, seldom thought of is the impact of feral cats on wildlife. And uh, uh, they do uh, impact passerine songbird populations and other populations, so that needs to be considered. In terms of management of any wildlife or feral population, um, Studies that have gone on all over the place, including the Bear Study, Sharon Brock uh, uh, study on Aspen, other studies that have gone on, indicate to be effective in, in managing animals and people, it takes two things, education, and then actually three things, education, um, education, education, that's number one. Secondly, uh, ordinances, laws, regulations that uh, are most appropriate for handling the problem and then thirdly, the enforcement. All three of those have to be done, but education is the cornerstone of it. So I wish you luck on that one. It's uh, uh, five or 10 years in the process, and it's going to be a long one to get through. But I'm here to t this evening to talk about Wanaka Lake. I uh, uh, brought up uh, uh, our last sampling report, uh, which was 2009, and then also our stocking schedule for Wanaka Lake from 2007-2014 to give you all an idea of, of what's gone on there. Um, we've talked a little bit. There's, I've seen some of the emails that have come to the city staff and come your way, and there's concerns expressed by the community, and the com uh, concerns are justifiable. Anytime you see a, a lake dry up, there are going to be impacts to the wildlife, the fishery resource, and to try to do what's right by the wildlife, by the fish, is always uh, uh, admirable and uh, something that we should always consider. So we totally agree with that. Just uh, as some background about Colorado Parks and Wildlife, we're the state agency that's charged with preservation, protection, and enhancement of Colorado's wildlife resource for the use and benefit of the people of the state of Colorado and those who come to visit us. We actually manage 960 different species of wildlife. Um, I saw some emails saying that Parks and Wildlife would care about bears, uh, like the uh, uh, city manager uh, talked about a, a while ago and other, other big critters, uh, but we do care about common snapping turtles. We do care about uh, garter snakes. We do care about uh, black crown night herons and great blue herons and a whole host of other critters. And, and so uh, doing right by them is in everyone's interest. Our, our goal, our charge is to manage the wildlife resource. We have 37 state parks that we, had, we manage. We also have over 300 state wildlife areas that we manage. We own or, or lease the properties and we do the management on there. And then we work with literally dozens of counties and cities throughout the state of Colorado on the lands that they own or administer, parks and recreation lands, to do what we can for the wildlife resource on those. Because those make the uh, um, uh, park, the, the places, the open spaces, a much more pleasurable uh, destination for your residents and uh, your citizens and, and hopefully the people who come and visit here and then after they go fishing at Wanaka Lake will have a burger or, or a, 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 a dinner at one of the Mexican restaurants in town like uh, uh, we all like to do. So um, it benefits all of us, and so we all work together. Um, the, in looking at this lake, um, it's inevitable um, uh, to, that the drawdown needs to occur from what we understand. Um, the city needs to do it to fix the valve so that they can manage the water appropriately uh, as your, is your legal obligation. So no ifs, ands, or buts about that. Um, so we're going to have to work on that. My understanding of talking with city staff, no one's quite sure how far the lake level is going to go before um, you, the screw comes up and, and uh, y'all are able to fix it. Um, there may be a little bit of residual water, uh, a conservation pool left in it, or it 
it may go totally dry. Um, in doing that, um, jumping in at the first step in panic mode and trying to do something oftentimes is a waste of time and energy and, and uh, really doesn't accomplish very much. And so uh, Parks and Wildlife, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, we're very fortunate in our state. We are one of the best wildlife agencies in the country, one of the best fishery agencies in the country. We have uh, one of the most uh, uh, well-established and, and well-thought-of research components in our agency. Uh, we have excellent biologists on staff, excellent field people. Our field people, like myself, are also biologists, and so uh, we have the basic background. We operate um, using best management practices, science-based, rather than based on sentimentality or, or other things that sometimes come into the discussion. And then also adaptive management. When a crisis is going to come up, rather than jumping right in, it's best to stand back, figure out what is the nature of the crisis, what are the predictable outcomes, and how do we intervene if we need to. Oftentimes when people deal with wildlife um, and think of wildlife, they think, oh man, we've got to go save them. And uh, when you think about it, uh, a common snapping turtle um, or the uh, a spiny softshell turtle that might be in the bottom of Wanaka Lake right now, those guys have been traipsing around this part of Colorado for about 25 million years. And they pretty well have it figured out. They know when the water goes down, move someplace else. They have adaptive strategies of their own to go by hard, or to get by hard times. And so, um, pushing the panic button sometimes is not a great idea. We also have some concerns in terms of going and grabbing wildlife from this place and hauling it to that place. Seems like a good idea, but there are some issues there. There are issues when, in species like turtles um, that uh, may not move too far from place to place. You have subpopulations around the state. And so if I, we take turtles from Wanaka Lake and take them down to Lamar or Pueblo or wherever, uh, that we're mixing genetics, that may be not a great idea. We're also certainly, when we're doing that, we're handling water. Anytime you handle water and you're moving fish, moving uh, uh, aquatic reptiles, um, you have the chance of moving disease or uh, uh, invasive species from point A to point B. We've seen these kind of issues in our state, uh, chronic wasting disease, whirling disease. Whirling disease is a disease from Europe that was brought over in the 1950s in a load of brown trout, if I remember right. Started in New York, moved across the state. Uh, the United States got to Colorado about 20 years ago. Uh, Parks and Wildlife has spent well over 15 million correcting the situation. Through best science, through adaptive management, we've overcome the problem. But that's $15 million and hundreds and thousands of hours of uh, uh, time uh, to get her done. So oftentimes, we need to think really hard, really close before we take those steps. You can look at zebra mussels, quagga uh, mu mussels. Uh, you can look at your, your Eurasian milfoil. Um, there's a, a parasitic copepods um, that are running rampant around the country. We're trying to, to lower that risk. If you all ever go out to a lake in, in a boat before you launch a boat in Colorado, your boat gets inspected to make sure that it's dry and clean and not contaminated. And that's to protect waters from being um, uh, further infected and spreading those diseases or those issues. So, jumping into s and solving the whole world's problems right now is probably not the best idea. We've got a good idea of what's in this lake from a fishery standpoint. If you look um, on the uh, front page this that's like that, I've got all kinds of scribbling on mine. Uh, the sample was taken by electrofishing in 2009. Um, it wasn't an outstanding um, uh, harvest of fish, you know, 87 black crappie, it was an hour electrofishing time, uh, 87 crappie that averaged 6.3 inches in length. That's about like that. Mm -hmm. A good crappie should be 8 to 10 inches, and you want a slab crappie to go from here to there to be a good quality fish for the frying pan to take home. I think the crappie uh, averaged it route at two ounces. Not an outstanding fishery there right now. Uh, what they catch? Two largemouth bass in an hour's fishing time. Pretty marginal. Uh, walleye uh, sogeye is a walleye sauger hybrid. Uh, caught three of those and they were good size, but not very much productivity for uh, an hour. So 
green sunfish are a really good fish. So, you know, it's an okay fishery. We did not set nets in the lake based on this sample. This sample didn't uh, uh, indicate to us that we ought to do further testing. So we've got a marginal fishery. The main use for um, this lake uh, in terms of recreational fishing is spring and fall plants of rainbow trout, catchable rainbow trout that are about this big, hopefully 10 to 12 inches. Uh, those are planted in when the water temperatures are right for their survival. They're planted in with the expectation that in about two weeks all of them will be caught out before the water temperature gets too high um, and we're averaging around four or five thousand per year that are going into that lake at about a buck and a half per fish so we're spending six seven thousand dollars on rainbow trout just as a recreational component so not a great lake so as the lake goes down we'll continue to look we'll see what's there if you know that it's a really good lake you, you, you'll, you'll see several different uh, signs of it. First off, we issued a salvage order so that anyone can go and catch whatever they want. If the lake is a good quality fishery, the anglers know about it. And as soon as that salvage order went out, we should have had the shoreline rimmed with anglers. I was out on Saturday. There was a dad, two daughters that were fishing. And then we were out yesterday looking. I didn't see a single angler. So that's an indicator to me that it's not a really hot fishery that's going to draw people from anywhere, and we're not going to lose a whole lot. If it's a really hot fishery, you're going to see piscivorous birds. You're going to see American white pelicans there constantly. You're going to see double-crested cormorants there. You're going to see uh, great blue herons in numbers. You're going to see belted kingfishers. You're going to see terns. You're going to see uh, gulls. Don't really see those right now. As that lake draws down, the fish are going to become more concentrated and more available. So this uh, is really a good timing in terms of that because we have migration starting. And so as migration occurs, as the lake goes down, as the fish become more concentrated and more available, you might see a bump in these piscivorous birds coming in. Hopefully, as the lake goes down far enough, we'll see uh, uh, birds like bald eagles, American bald eagle coming in because they're a primary piscivorous species. And so those uh, uh, birds will work on a good resource. To give you an idea of how important that can be, uh, we had a pond over in Boulder County that was infested with uh, goldfish. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, <laughs> um, we were making plans to uh, go in and rote known or kill those goldfish out because they're a competitive species, an invasive species, uh, a noxious species. And as we were doing our planning, it came the time when the white pelican migrated back to Colorado. In about five days, we had huge amounts of white pelicans go in, and they pretty well cleaned out the goldfish for us. And so let nature do its course. Amazing. You know, but that speaks also to something else that we need to be concerned about at Wanaka Lake. What's in that lake? Not only are the sport fish that we've planted in there probably, but uh, there have been some parents that uh, when their kids go away to college and the uh, goldfish uh, that have been in the bowl on, this, on the uh, mantle for uh, a couple of years, um, they go in the lake. Uh, when a family goes and buys a red-eared slider, which is an exotic invasive species of turtle that's sold at pet stores, um, and the parents get sick of it or the kids no longer want them, they go in the nearest lake. And so once you start looking at what's in the lake, uh, we might see that there's some of those invasive species that by no stretch of the imagination should be moved anywhere else. They should be euthanized, and they would be euthanized, and they will be euthanized when we're working on it. So as we go through the fall, water level will go down. We'll continue to watch. We'll continue to see what birds show up. If it becomes really apparent, we'll try to figure out how to get to the lake. One thing is the lake goes down, you've got to worry that right now we're kind of on churdy, uh, the uh, hard, hard pan that you can drive a vehicle on. As it goes down farther, it might be mud and muck, so it gets really hard to work. So if we're able to get to it, if we're able to work it, we'll do what we need to do. Uh, we're going to be bringing in a couple of turtle traps and to set turtles uh, for turtles and see what we've got. Um, in looking at... Uh, um, natural history of turtles, I went to the, the gold source. This is Hammerson. It's Colorado, amphibians and reptiles. This is the best uh, uh, available source for information on the taxonomy and natural history of the, the uh, reptiles and amphibians in the state of Colorado. When you read in there about common snapping turtle, and one of the uh, staff that I talked with yesterday has seen common snapping turtle come out in June and lay their eggs on the exercise pit uh, <laughs> around the edge, which is 
totally uh, typical behavior for common snapping turtles. They'll lay 60 to 65 eggs. Um, the temperature of the soil will determine the sex of the uh, hatchlings. And so uh, we do know there's common snapping turtles in there. But in reading Hammerson, you know, everyone's worried about, well, oh, it's going to be dewatered, they'll be down in the mud, and they'll just freeze to death. Well, uh, in reading Hammerson, it said that uh, common snapping turtles commonly uh, go, in, rather than winter in the bottom of the lake, they'll crawl under a log on the edge of the shoreline. Uh, they have records of them crawling under haystacks. And so if we get into October, late October, early November, usually on Plains Reservoirs will freeze up between November 10th and November 20th. By Thanksgiving, most of them are frozen up. We'll keep a really close watch, and if we see uh, some snapping turtles out, we can figure out a solution to that. Um, the other turtles in there, spiny soft-celled turtles, uh, those guys uh, can uh, bury themselves in mud. And uh, the painted turtles, the ones that bask on logs that are so pretty and absolutely the kids love to see them, uh, those guys guys have a, co a common record of um, nesting, or not nesting, but wintering out in mud in uh, underneath less than one meter of water. So hopefully we'll have a little bit of a residual pool that these guys can be in, but we can always figure out and accommodate. Um, it also, uh, for all three species, and those are the three species of native turtles you might find in Colorado, um, are all going to... Um, uh, they say that they all move from pond to pond as things become uh, dry out. So they're going to take care of themselves by and large. So there have been some emails that I've seen that said, man, you guys need to hire a consultant, you know, and I'm not here to denigrate <laughs> <That's you>. private <laughs> um, enterprise by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, I work with consultants on a lot of flood rebuilds um, throughout Colorado since the 2013 flood. My area is most severely hit of any of the areas in the state of Colorado. Uh, we work with aquatic consultants all the time, both in private and public uh, um, settings, and we have a collaborative relationship with them just like we have towns and cities and police departments <coughs> and everyone else. And we work together well. Um, my suggestion if you're going to pay a consultant, that's fine, and second opinions are always great, but maybe that money might be better set, spent in trying to figure out what should we make that pond after the screw is fixed, after the valve works, after we re-impound re -impound it, after the water's back there to make it a better place for wildlife and for people. And so I've got a couple of suggestions. Maybe you could use that money that would use on a uh, um, consultant uh, first and foremost, to construct a real boat ramp at that lake so that if the city staff needs to get out on the lake to do some work, if our biologists need to go out to do the work, or God forbid, if you have a tragedy out there and you have to go either retrieve a person or a body, that we can get onto the lake easily. So maybe that's a good thing. And that's the best time to do it is when the lake is down. Uh, maybe if you all have some spare clean concrete uh, that could go in large slabs and uh, so that we can make some crevices, that uh, would benefit channel catfish that are in that lake. Um, they are cavity nesters, and so putting that on the bottom, I understand the lake is, has 30 foot maximum depth, so you can put that out and you won't have problems with uh, boat striking it or anything else. One of the best suggestions I can make is while the lake is down in November, December, when it's frozen, the shoreline's frozen and you can move a dump truck down there, uh, a load of two or three or four or five of pea gravel set at two foot depth for maximum depth in uh, May and early June, and also at seven to eight feet in depth uh, for centrarchids. Um, the sunfish, uh, bluegill, uh, green sunfish, red-eared sunfish, largemouth bass and smallmouth bass need clean pea gravel and non-fluctuating water at that elevation for nesting. And so if we create that nesting habitat, and then we go and we throw in those red-eared sunfish, we throw in the bluegill, then we can get good production, and those are the ones that are fun for kids to catch. My first fish that I ever caught that I remember, I was about three years old up in Minnesota, we lived up north then, was a, what, a brim. Uh-huh. And everyone in this room, you catch those sunnies, right? Walleyes. Walleyes. And once you catch the first one, you're hooked. You're hooked for life. Right? Okay? 
That big, huh, Gary? So we need to get that dump truck out there, and as a volunteer project, we can get people to help spread it and, and do that. So let's look at that. Um, we've had people talk about um, um, using Christmas tree restructures or spider blocks as fish attracting habitat. You know, those are work and those are nice and they're great volunteer projects. They won't create more fish. What they do is concentrate small fish, which brings big fish close by. You fish to that structure and you ha you're more liable to catch a fish. Those are great. Uh, but they're not absolutely in that, in essential. Uh, one thing I worked on when I was a district wildlife manager in the town of Windsor, we got a, a, a bunch of money to, to work develop uh, uh, Windsor Lake, which is a beautiful uh, facility now. Uh, prior to that, we had lots of double crested cormorants, pelicans at that lake. Uh, they would haul out onto mud flats um, to, to uh, rest, to loaf and or to dry their wings. Double-crested cormorants are such a primitive bird, they don't have an oil gland, so their wing feathers get wet. They start sinking, so they sit on rocks and stones like that. So what we did was take a bunch of tree bowls, tree trunks, cabled them, uh, weighted them down, they were floating, and then now you go out on the west side of, of Windsor Lake and you see double-crested cormorants going like that and, and uh, pelicans and other stuff. It's watchable wildlife habitat. It makes the place more attractive, relatively easy to do. And when we were out there yesterday, a big old chunk of uh, your box elder tree came down. That would have been perfect for wiring out there. So uh, that's another one. And then always interpretive signage. So there's stuff that we can do. When it's re-impounded, or this winter, Paul Winkle is our aquatic biologist. We'll be sitting down and we'll be putting together, what will the plan be? What is the stocking? We'll start with forage base. We'll start working up. I would really love us to, uh, to, to work on a, a good warm water fishery in addition to this rainbow catchable trout fishery. So thoughts, ideas, questions, comments, concerns? Wow, that's very helpful. Oh, I think okay. we, yeah. we all needed that lesson. And, yeah. and very, very comprehensive, thorough. yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. thank you. Thank you. Thank We're you here all much. the time. Um, Y'all got my number. Thank I have much. actually one question before yes, you leave. Yeah. The Greenlee Reservoir that's right there, will that also be completely depleted? With no. The, no. Okay. Um, that, that will remain the same. Yeah, Greenlee has been independent. In the past, we have funneled water into it. Um, um, it's ne people say it's dried up. It's not. I've been by there. It's always been pretty low, and it is really pretty good bird habitat at its current structure. And it looks, yeah, it looks like it's just a normal fluctuating uh, riparian site. And so yeah, in the drought, we lost all moisture and drove off the birds, but the birds are back, and we think that this, what we're doing on Wanaka, will not change greenly, okay. up or down. Okay. I wanted to clarify that. So they'll Good. still be. Other questions, comments, concerns? No, I think that's great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Appreciate it. Incredibly helpful. And um, what's great is that it's it can be archived on our website. So if we have questions from constituents, I think that's a really thorough, um, Very thorough. Well, thorough information for them to review. So.